Hello, and I'm here in the sick form, uh, sick form common room, obviously without the sick formers. And this week's episode of Hamel's Histories, we're going to be looking at the history of Europe through the history of field artillery. Bit of a bit of a random topic, I realise, but it's labelled from Romans to the Western Front: a history of field artillery. Now, it's important for us to note that we are going to be talking about field artillery only, not siege warfare. So if you're hoping that we're going to talk about lengthy castle sieges, then I'm afraid this is not going to be the talk of you. But in many ways, a history of field artillery is a history of the art of war. Now, artillery is known to us as the king of the battlefield, and its evolution goes a long way to explaining the changing nature of warfare in Europe. Now, we're going to look briefly at the Roman Empire. Now, the first recorded use of artillery was by the Greeks when in 399 BC, the tyrant Dionysus of Syracuse ordered the construction of bolt-throwing catapults. However, artillery had very little impact on the battlefield of the Greek world. It was Rome that first embraced field artillery, and the rise and fall of Roman artillery helps us to chart the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, there are two basic types of Roman field artillery. Now we've got the Lipobolus, which threw stones, and the Ballista. Now both are originally taken from Greek designs and uh, in 146 BC, like much of what Rome achieved, they had taken from their work, the idea from the Greeks and then improved and refined it. And so in the first century BC, there's a, a Roman machine called the Scorpion that's introduced. Now it's a very small ballista, I suppose a little bit bigger than a crossbow, and its metal bolts could travel straight through two men. It proved to be highly useful in 55 BC when Julius Caesar attempted to land in Britain. Now the Britons were, were making it very difficult for Caesar to land until they were cleared from the, uh, from the landing zones, as it were, from the beaches by, uh, by Caesar using scorpions mounted on ships. Now they're small two-man devices that can propel bolts and that they are a bit of a giant crossbow to try and clear men off the landing zone. Now in the first century AD you have what's called the Caraballista. Now this is mobile artillery and it's quite exciting for the evolution of field artillery. It's a ballista mounted on a cart. Such a simple idea, a two-man ballista mounted on a cart. And there's one attached to each century in the first century AD. And so each legion has around 55 of these mobile ballista carts. Now it's got an all iron frame, which makes the, actually what makes the weapon lighter. You might say, why would an all iron frame make it lighter? You need a much thinner amount of iron than you do of wood. And so they're, they're more mobile. And also by making an all iron frame as opposed to a wooden frame, it includes the range of these things by around 25%. A spring release mechanism made it much more accurate also. And they're also what we call uh, a Chikri, uh, sorry, Chikiro Ballista, which is an even smaller bolt, which only has a single operator to use. But as the Roman Empire fell into decline in the late 2nd century AD, uh, probably around the reign of Commodus in 180 AD, and into the crisis of the 3rd century AD, then a new artillery piece, the Onager, or the Wild Ass, is introduced. Now, this has a crew of eight, and so less convenient and it needed a brick built base and so they've gone from mobile carts with artillery mounted on the back of the carts to something that now you require considerable planning to be able to fight a, a pitched battle with you need a brick based field but it's wildly inaccurate and uh, only 10 are made available for each legion now i'm a huge fan of the historian charles a man for all the, the limits to his scholarship that he's a man who could tell a great tale we have here the, his words now, so these more primitive weapons were indicative of the general decline of torsion artillery in the Latin Empire, and it'd be many centuries until the field until the field of battle would once again see artillery with the sophistication and the numbers that the Romans could field. And so we're going to have to skip forward quite a bit with the decline of the Roman Empire and the decline of their ability to put field artillery out. We now need to skip to. I suppose 1304 
And so Inferno 4, during the Franco-Flemish War of 1297 to 1305, two ballista were again mounted on wheels and used by the Flemish as mobile artillery called Springola at the Battle of Mons en Pavel. But in Western Europe, it's Edward III who can be seen as the father of field artillery. Now, from around 1325, Europe had started to experiment with what we'd think of as cannon. Uh, Christchurch, Oxford, holds a vase-shaped cannon given to Edward III on his coronation. It's, uh, it's an incredible piece. It's called a pot de feu, or vasi in Italian, and it, it fires a feathered bolt. So a cannon that fires, a, that fires what looks like, I suppose, an, an arrow or a crossbow bolt. Now, in 1337, right at the beginning of the, the Hundred Years' War, there were what we call ribalds, or organ guns. They're several small tubes clamped together and able to fire quickly, mounted on wheels and fitted, uh, fitted with a, a mantle to protect the crew from arrows. They're used to defend gates. I suppose they look like a cart with lots of guns strapped together. Uh, they're also known as the carts of war. One person can light all the barrels in succession because the gunpowder trail comes out of the multiple uh, barrels into a groove at the back. If you light the gunpowder at the back, the charge will go up the groove and into the barrels, <coughs> allowing a small crew to loose off a lot of firepower into a confined space. But of course, the reload time is, is quite slow. Uh, Edward actually ordered 100 of these for the Cressy campaign. But they probably, not definitely, but probably arrived too late to take part in the Battle of Cressy itself. Now the ribald, or the organ gun, uh, was short-ranged, and I say his reload time was incredibly slow, but it was incredibly useful in particular to the English. It could guard the flanks of armies as they engaged opposing armies, and if two sides were facing, were, were facing each other, unwilling to engage, then the guns could force the other side to attack as happened at the Battle of Formigny in 1450, because you don't want, once they've loosed these barrels, you don't want to give your opponent time to reload them, and so you're compelled to advance. And this really fits in well with the English way of war at this time, which the English have developed a, a remarkably different form of war to the French. They, their knights are mostly fighting on foot to protect the longbowmen, and the hope is that the longbow will impel the French to charge uh, onto the English bill blocks where the English billmen can then hack the French knights down as they have come emerging through the arrow storm. And so in 1346 onwards, you've got cannon of brass and copper uh, start to become more numerous, but they're more for siege work than they are for the battlefield. Now in 1382, you had the rebellion of the Flemish of, uh, of Ghent, and they used over a hundred rebolts at the Battle of Bruges. And so an incredible amount of firepower suddenly being put in by these crude pieces of field artillery. But from 1400 onwards, the ribald was replaced by handgunners. And so you would have blocks of handgunners rather than these carts of guns strapped together. And the cannon starts to become more common upon the battlefield. And so from the 1440s onwards, castle walls, walls become far less useful, useful as they can be knocked down by the increasingly powerful cannon. And then we need to look next at 1476 and the Battle of Gransom and Murat as part of the Burgundian Wars of 1474 to 77. 